All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I got another one like the other one. I got another banger for you guys. And I'm going to get straight into it because, like always, my days are just not long enough. I know I keep saying that, but you guys don't even know. I wanted to try to get this one out to you guys last night, yesterday, but I got caught up doing something else. So hopefully I'm going to be able to get this out to you guys tonight. Anyways, this story right here, it involves... Two Mexican Mafia members, one that just recently passed away, and that's Michael Fly Torres from Safe, and another individual by the name of Daryl Night Albaca, who I know personally. I was up in the Bay with him, and he's another household name. He was another household name up there. He's somebody that has a lot of history within their organization, and he's been around for a while. Anyway, this story right here, it involves an individual by the name of Stomper from Sanfe. Now, Stomper was an individual that was apparently, he was well known within his neighborhood. And he comes from a long lineage of, you know, people that are from his neighborhood. He's the oldest of four brothers and all four brothers are in the system right now. He's got life. He's got another brother that's got life. And the two other brothers, they've both been down for, you know, ranges from 17 to 21 years. So all four of them have been in the system for a while. And, you know, all four of them are known well within the system. And for those of you that are tapping in in the comments and are validating some of these guys that you know that have been mentioned in these stories, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the comments, everybody that's tapping in and everybody that's, that's you know, following these stories right here. Anyway, so... You know, the thing about the thing about Sanfe is that it's a multi-generational gang that, you know, Sanfe is one of those one of those gangs that could probably make a good argument that it's one of the probably one of the biggest neighborhoods out there in the San Fernando Valley. It's a big neighborhood. And a lot of the a lot of the people that are, you know, that are from that neighborhood, there's aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers. If you're from that neighborhood, it's because you were born out there and, you know, usually you got family that are also part of that that neighborhood. You know, this is a this is a, a neighborhood that has been around since the 1920s. So it's been around for a long time. And it's one of those neighborhoods that's like family oriented. They're, they're always, you know, out at the parks, throwing barbecues and they're just a tight knit neighborhood. If you're from that neighborhood, it's more than likely that you were either born or raised out there in the San Fernando Valley. Of course, you got outsiders that that move in, but for the most part, like I said, they're a real tight knit neighborhood, and most of them are born and raised out there. So Stompers, he's somebody that's known in the hood. He's somebody that's put in a lot of work out there. I believe since the time he was around twelve or thirteen, he's put a lot of work in out there. He's somebody that's known and respected. His brothers are known and respected, and you know they've been out there all their lives. None of them got smut on them. You know, their name's good out there. And like I said, all of them are in prison. So like I said, one of one one of Stomper's brothers and him got life and they've been down for a while. Now, in 2008, Stomper caught a case that sent him to prison. The case that he's in on right now. I believe he's been down for about 30 years right now. But he hit, he ended up hitting the county jail. He went through the county jail. And then from the county jail, he ended up going to prison. So he gets shipped off of state. So he's there. He's plugged in. And of course, he knows Mosca. Mosca, Michael Torres, they call him Fly or Mosca. I'll probably be using both names throughout this spill right here. So hopefully you guys ain't going to get confused. But anyway, so, you know, he knows he knows Fly. So Fly is considered his big homie since he's from his neighborhood. In fact, he not only knows Mosca, but Mosca had a sister named Carol that apparently just recently passed away. And Carol was married to one of Stomper's, I, I believe it was his cousin or one of his uncles named Largo. So they're not they're not related through blood, they're related through through marriage. So at so after after Stomper lands, he gets to prison. At some point, he ends up picking up a pegada. He he does a removal and he ends up catching the shoe program. He goes to the shoe, he's back there in the shoe program. And obviously that's around the time when everybody was back there. So I imagine when he got back there, they lace him up. He gets around a lot of other and metals back there. And 
you know, they game him up. He, he picks up some game while he's back there in the shoe. Everybody does. The shoe is like the training grounds back there. Most of the time that we spend back there is, is educating each other. Everybody does it. The, the, the ABs, the Mexican Mafia, the NF, the, the Africanos. That's that's basically all you have to do. Everybody's pretty much offline. You're not out there on the main lines. You're not running around out there on the yards. We're stuck back there on the shelf in the shoe. And that time is used to educate, to, to indoctrinate whatever belief system, whatever gang you belong to. So after he finishes up his shoe, they end up kicking him out to a facility, a yard in Pelican Bay. And, you know, he gets out there and his younger brother's out there. He's out there with a handful of, you know, of his homies from his neighborhood and him and his younger brother, they end up selling up together. They sell up and they're basically keeping each other out of trouble because Stomper had a history of getting loaded. He likes to drink. And when he gets drunk and when he, you know, when he's on dope, he starts doing dumb shit. So his little brother keeps him in check. They're keeping each other out of trouble. You know, they're on a level four yard. There's active Mexican mafia members out there. They got policies, procedures that they got to follow. And, you know, they're keeping each other out of trouble. They're in the cell and everything's, you know, they're having it their way at this time. So his little brother ends up getting shipped out to Kern Valley. He's over there. As soon as he leaves, Stomper starts messing up. He starts drinking. He starts getting loaded. He starts getting in trouble. He starts accumulating debt out there. You know, he, he likes to get loaded. So he accumulates a little bit of dope debt, but he's out there. He's still programmed. He's still doing his thing. At some point, some individual, another Sureno, drives up from Blythe Street. So this guy drives up, and as soon as he gets there, he starts talking about Fly, Mosca, that he knows him, that you know they got a lot of history together, that he worked under him on the streets for, for an extended period of time. And he's talking about Fly like they're best friends. This guy's from Blythe Street. Anyways, so, you know... He's just constantly name name dropping. And a lot of individuals do that. They drop names, you know, as a way to get a little bit of credibility using somebody else's names. And a lot of the times, Mexican mafia members, I know, sees we never we never like that. You know, individuals to use names in order to you know establish some kind of credibility out on the yard. Name we call it name dropping. So this guy. He starts name dropping Fly. You know, he knows him. He, he's worked under him out there on the streets. How him and Fly are real close. Well, come to find out, it was all bullshit. This dude don't know Fly. He's never worked under him. Fly don't even know who he is. And you guys know that, you know, now everybody out there, they got cell phones. So as soon as somebody pulls up on a yard, there's phone calls being made. People can tap in with other people. I imagine at some point somebody puts a phone call out to fly and ask him about this individual. This guy's new on the yard. He needs to be cleared. So they get it fly and they ask him, hey, you know, this individual right here and fly has no idea who they're talking about. He's like, I, I don't know this dude, but whoever he is, go ahead and get rid of him. Whack that motherfucker, man. I don't know who he is, but whoever he is, he must have an agenda. He's using my name like he knows me. He said he was working under me. Nah, nah, I don't know. I don't know that dude. He says something's up with them. You know, I, I didn't know Fly personally. Mosca, I've heard people talk about him in the past. And I've heard that he had a history of putting a lot of people in the hat, that he had a lot of people hit. He just recently got killed, like I mentioned earlier on in this in this story. He was recently killed. That's another story for another day. But, you know, but, you know, if that's the kind of agenda that you're pushing sooner or later, you know, karma's going to come back. You know, if that's the kind of C that you are, if you're out there pushing a hard line, you're having a lot of people hit and you're just that type of individual. You instill a lot of fear in people. You're somebody that that rules with the iron fist. You're like a dictator out there. Sooner or later, that's going to catch up to you. Bad karma always catches up to you. Anyway, so so at this time, when flies out there on a yard. So Daryl Baca's out there. He's got the yard established. He's running the yard, how he runs the yard. He's another individual that's known to push a hard line. So at some point, Night Owl gets in touch with, with Fly. And like I said, Fly tells him to go ahead and have that individual from Black whack him. Go ahead and get rid of him. You know, Fly thinks that he's got some kind of agenda, that he's up to something. But, you know, somebody that, that 
comes out to a yard and starts name dropping about, you know, a reputable C like that, that raises red flags right off the bat. So Night Owl's in a precarious situation. He's out there. He's one of the, you know, he's one of these guys that has been back there in the shoot program for, for years. I don't know exactly how long. I know he's been back there for a while, 20, maybe 30 years. He's out there on the yard, and a lot of the times, straight up, the administration knows who's running the yard. They they make it, you know, their business of finding out who runs the yard for the Sureños, who runs the yard for the Northaniels, who runs the yard for the BGF and for the for the Aryan Brotherhood. So they want to know what's going on out there on 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 those yards. Now. Somebody like like Night Owl that has been locked up in the shoe, stranded back there for years, for decades, he gets out, he's out there, he's got cell phones, he can go to the canteen now, he's hitting Karaga, he's having it his way, he's winning. But individuals like that who are intoxicated with that newfound freedom that they that they have now, you know, something that they used to sit back in the shoe and dream about. And now that it's a reality, they got to find the balance of running the yard the way it's supposed to be ran, while at the same time trying not to shake up too much shit so that they don't end up getting moved. So Night Owl's out there, you know, he's got this dilemma on his hands now. Fly wants this guy whacked. But like I said, Night Owl has to find that balance to where, you know, he can't just go out there and, and not conduct Mexican mafia business. People still need to be hit. They got to still make sure that their household is cleansed of all trash, people that might slip through, people like this individual from Blythe. So, you know, he doesn't want to put himself in a position or a situation where people think that he's no longer working in the best interest of that organization. He still has to, you know, put green lights on individuals that got it coming. He still needs to push that hard line. That's his job as a Mexican mafia member. So what Night Owl does is, you know, he agrees to have this individual hit and Stomper, he raises his hand to do it. You know, he's there ever since his little brother left. He really doesn't want to be there no more. There's, he knows that there's a chance that if he picks up a shoot program, he ends up going and, and does some shoot time. He might end up getting transferred, you know, back to another prison where one of his other brothers might be at. So he wants to get up out of there. There's really nothing on that yard for him or there's no reason why he really wants to stay there. So he raises his hand and he tells Night Out, hey, I'll do it. So Night Out tells Stomper, he's like, look, this individual, the only thing he's really guilty of is running his mouth, name dropping. You know, he, he hasn't. Ain't killed nobody. He doesn't owe a lot of money or nothing like that. There's no reason why we need to try to kill this individual. But he's like, go ahead and whack the dude. Get him off the yard. Don't do no extra shit. Just do what you just do what you need to do to get him up out of here. So at that point, you know, Stomper goes back to his cell and, you know, he's he's thinking in his mind. He's formulating a plan. How am I going to do this? Where am I going to get this individual at? You know, when, whenever you get ready to to, to go on a, a pegada like this or you're getting ready to put in some work, you know, it, it it there's a little bit of stress that comes with it. I don't care who you are that, and, and I don't care what people say that, you know, it's nothing. They just do it without even tripping. You know, you got to get your mind mentally right to go do something like this. At least I know that that's the way that it's always been with me. You know, you're going out there on a yard, you're getting ready to stab somebody. You're out there in one of these institutions that don't mess around when it comes to shooting people. Pelican Bay is one of those prisons where, you know, if they see you going in on somebody with a weapon, they're going to try to take a headshot. They're going to try to kill you. Every opportunity they get to take somebody down, they're going to take them down. And Pelican Bay is known for that. So, you know, Stompers trying to formulate a plan. Where am I going to get this individual at? Where, where's the best place to do it? Should I do it on the yard? Should I do it in one of the Sally ports? Should I do it in the chow hall? Where should I do it? He's trying to figure out, obviously, the best place to do it that will minimize, you know, the chances of him getting busted, blind spots, while at the same time, you know, minimizing the possibility of him getting shot while he's doing it. Where's the best place that you got places out there on the yard where 
you know, you can see where all the gunners are at and some spots are, they're, they're either far off, you know, in the corner somewhere, or you got something that might be blocking you. So you're out there, you've hit that yard many times. You're somebody that's, that's, you know, obviously you've been out there and you've pretty much, you know, that entire yard, like the back of your hand, everybody does that's out there. You know, you walk that yard every day, you get to know that yard. So you know where all the blind spots are at. You know where all the spots are at. So he got his banger and he's ready to go. Got himself pumped up. He formulates a plan. His plan was to get him out in the middle of the yard by the basketball court or by the handball courts, wherever, wherever he figured was the best spot for him to do it. So this individual from Blythe, he has no idea what's going on. He's oblivious to his surroundings. He's probably still talking about fly. He comes out to the yard and, you know, Stopper, he, he formulates a plan to get some other Sureños to, to help assist him to get that individual over in the area where he wants to hit him at. And, you know, that's what they do. So some other Sureños, they, they play him out of pocket. They they short talk him, probably give him a couple of or something. And, well, they don't smoke no more. So I don't know. Maybe they gave him an ice cream or went over to the canteen and bought him a soda. I don't know. But, you know, they 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 get him comfortable. So they walk him over to whatever area Stomper decided he was going to hit him in. And so eventually Stomper starts heading over there to that area of the yard. He gets over there. He's got his banger on him. And he sees this individual from Blythe. He's talked to him. So, you know, that individual, he greets him. They start talking. And... When Stomper felt the time was right, he looks over at the gunners, it's go time. So he pulls out his banger and he starts whacking this dude. Bam, bam, bow, big bop, big bop, big bop, bam. <laughs> so he starts, he starts hitting this dude. He starts going in on the dude. And, you know, like I said, Night Owl apparently told him not to do nothing extra. Just hit the dude and get him off the yard. Even though that that is contradictive to what I told you guys, these guys, for the most part, are pushing a hard line out there. They want these guys to kill these individuals. It's not going to be absolute. Sometimes you're going to have situations like this, and this was one of them. So Stomper's hitting this individual. He's hitting them, and you know all the Sureños out there, they all know what's going to happen. Everybody knows, you know, in situations like this, when somebody's going to get hit, there's some type of you know, for us, we used to put, you know, the North Daniels on a full 60, which is a security caveat that basically means to keep your eyes, you know, to keep your eyes open, keep your head on a swivel. Something is definitely going to happen. So I imagine, you know, whatever kind of signal, whatever they 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 tell each other as, as Sureños, the Mexican Mafia, whatever, whatever kind of, you know, verbiage they have to put their people on notice, they did that. And everybody out there, knows that something's going to happen. They're probably, you know, trying to do their dips and play handball and play basketball, but they're inconspicuously, they keep looking over there in that direction because everybody wants to see it. They're, they're, they're trying to stay focused on what they're doing, but they keep looking. They keep looking. They can't help but to keep looking. They keep rubbernecking because they want to look over there at that exact moment when this fool starts, you know, whacking this dude. So Stomper's hitting this dude and... Later on, he would say that, you know, he was watching the tower and he didn't see nobody in the tower. So he kept going. But apparently the gunner in one of the towers starts yelling at Stomper to get out, to stop or he was going to shoot. Stomper keeps going. He doesn't hear the gunner. So at one point, some of the other Sureños that are in that general area, they start telling Stomper, get out, bro. The, the you know, the gunner's going to shoot. Get your ass down. Right. So he doesn't even hear the homies. He doesn't even hear his homeboys yelling at him. So he's going in on this dude. And, you know, when, when you're stabbing somebody or you're getting off on somebody, your adrenaline is pumping. You know, his adrenaline is going. He's probably full of adrenaline and he's not even tripping off of nothing else. He's just focused on what he's doing. So the gunner, after telling him to get out several times, the gunner takes a shot and ends up hitting him in the leg. It ends up going into one of his thighs and it's a through and through wound. It blows a hole straight through his leg. And according to Stomper, which would, he would later say, he would later tell, you know, my boy that um, he didn't even feel it. 
Even even though he got hit with the mini 14, he didn't feel it. At the time, he probably thought it was a punch or a kick or something. Because this other dude tried to fight back or he was trying to block, you know, the 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 blows when he was getting stabbed. So Stomper gets dropped. He gets hit in the leg with the mini 14. It drops him. The yard goes down. They lay the yard down. Everybody's proned out. Stomper, at that point, he tries to get up and ends up realizing he can't get up. And then he looks down at his leg and he's, he's like, damn, my leg is, is mangled, right? His leg's destroyed. So this other guy from Blythe that he hits, he's probably thinking, you know what, man, fuck it, I'm, I'm, I'm done. If they're hitting me, I must, I must be in the hat. He jumps up and tries to go in on Stomper. So this dude jumps up and, you know, he, he probably figures, I might as well try to get mines in. And the other Surayans that are in the general area, they start yelling at that dude. Hey, back up. Back your ass up. Well, you know, they, they act like they were going to rush him. They tell him, hey, homeboy's, homeboy's shot, bro. You know what I mean? Let, let that shit go. So he gets down. He backs up. And that's pretty much that's pretty much the end of that situation right there. They end up life flighting Stomper up out of there because he was losing a lot of blood. He almost lost his leg. So they take that guy to the hole, they take him to Adse, and then they take Stomper to outside hospital. Like I said, he lost a lot of blood. He was leaking. He almost lost his leg. A mini 14 will, will do some, some serious damage if it hits you right, depending on how it hits you. If it hits you in the bone, it can make a mess out of your leg. Trust me. So he's in the He's in the hospital for about a good month, three weeks to a month. They do surgery on him. They fix up his leg, but he's in recovery for like a good two or three weeks. So in the meantime, in between time, when that happened, the institution goes on institutional lockdown. It's a full lockdown. Somebody got shot. And when that happens, you know, it's a little bit more serious than just a couple people out there fighting a physical altercation or even another, you know, another stabbing. If somebody doesn't get shot, more than likely, you know, they're going to either slam the yard down or slam the, the groups that are involved in that situation down and everybody else will come back out. But whenever there's an officer involved shooting like that, they take it a little bit more serious. I got to get involved. They got to do an investigation and all that good stuff. So they're on lockdown. And as soon as they go on lockdown, one of Stomper's homeboys that's there with them. He gets on the phone and he calls Stomper's little brother in Kern Valley. He calls him up and he's like, hey, your bro just got shot. He was doing a removal for Pops and, you know, he's cool. He's all right. He got hit in the leg, but he's at the he's at an outside hospital. I'm going to keep you posted on what, what happens, right? So Stomper's little brother, he's tripping. He's like, what? what are you serious, bro? Is he alive? Is he dead? He don't know what condition he's in, even though... You know, his homie told him that he's all right, you know, that that he's going to live, he ain't dead. When that happens to a family member and you're not there to see it, you don't know the, the details, you're going to start tripping. You're going to start worrying. His little brother start worrying. So, you know, coincidentally, it was close to Stomper's birthday, whether it was that week or a couple of days or whatever it was. Stomper's little brother knew that their mom was heading out that week to Pelican Bay to go see Stomper. So Stomper's little brother gets on the phone and he either called or he texts his mom and he's like, hey, you know, it's probably not a good idea to go up to the base. Something happened up there. It's not a good time. And his mom's like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? She's like, I just talked to him the other day. He's all happy. I'm coming. She's like, I paid for the hotels. I rented a car. You tripping. I'm, I'm, I'm going. You know, he wants to see me. It's his birthday. And she's like, unless you tell me what's going on, she's like, I'm going up there. So, you know, he's trying to convince her to, to not go up. He's just like, Mom, there's something going on. I want to talk about his politics, his prison shit, something that you don't need to know nothing about. She ends up hanging up the phone on him. So little brother, he's in the cell. He's tripping. He's trying to, you know, figure out a way to break this to his mom without stressing her out. What he does is he ends up calling her and he tells her, hey, look, mom, you know, I'm just going to be straight up. This is what happened. Somebody reached out. They told me, you know, Stomper ended up getting caught up in a situation and they, they ended up shooting him in the leg, but he's okay. And the mom, she starts freaking out. What do you mean they shot him in the leg? Are you crazy? 
you know, there's nothing you can tell a mother that's going to, there's no easy way to tell her that their, you know, their son has been shot and that he's going to be okay. That's, they take it serious. Obviously you guys can imagine that I'm sure. So, you know, she's freaking out. She's crying. She's, she hangs up. She starts calling the institution. She's trying to find out the details. They won't tell her nothing. Matter of fact, since then, they, they, I want to say it was, well, I can't say if it was this year or last year, but I remember they changed the policy when anybody ever gets life flighted out or they end up getting shot or taken out of the facility to an a outside hospital, they have to notify whoever's on your emergency contact list. So that's all changed. But at that time, they wouldn't give her no information. They were like, you know what? We can't give you that information. It's confidential. And that's that. So, you know, eventually she comes to terms of what's going on. The, the, the younger brother, he consoles her and he's like, you know, I'll find out as much as I can. I got a direct line over there. Just, just be patient, work with me because they're on lockdown. But I'm, I'm telling you, He's alive. He's not dead. He's he's you know, he took a leg shot and that's it. He's already healing up. And, you know, by this time it, it had been like a week or two. So, you know, he calms the mom down and she eventually cancels all her, you know, the, the room, the hotel, the car and all that. And she puts it off for a couple of weeks. So after the incident, you know, like I said, the individual from Blythe, he gets moved off the yard. He's gone. Daryl Baca, night out from Artesia 13, the individual that I told you guys was running that yard. You know, he's not really tripping. The, the job got done. And that's all that really matters to him. He's not tripping. He's still getting this guy to guy. So he don't really care about nothing else but that. <laughs> so anyways, after, after they patch Stomper up, they end up taking him back to the institution. They put him in ASU for a couple of weeks. I want to say it was like three weeks. He's in there. You know, he, he's, he's still recovering. His leg was like hamburger meat, but he's healing up. So he ends up going to classification at, at one point. And I guess, you know, when he goes to classification, they tell Stomper, look, you know, we're investigating that incident. The officer that shot you, there's some level of negligence that was involved he wasn't supposed to shoot you the way that he did or or something something about the way that the incident played out they were investigating it and they made stomper feel like you know that that the cop that shot him the gun the gunner that shot him that he bore some type of responsibility i'm not sure what it was maybe he didn't yell out a warning shot or maybe he didn't fire you know the 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 birth of, i don't know i don't know what it was but you know so when they see somebody with a banger, they're justified. They can take your head off. But anyways, whatever it was, he was under the, the cop that, that shot him was under investigation. So anyways, they kick him back out to the same yard. He gets back out there, night out from Artesia 13. He's still out there. And, you know, he him and Stomper, a very, apparently at one point, they end up, you know, touching base with each other out there and, Night Out tells him, man, I told you not to go in on that individual just to get rid of him. So he tells Night Out, he's like, he's like, man, I didn't even see the gunner. He was like, I kept looking up there. I didn't see him. You know, I thought I was good. So, you know, I didn't even know that that fool was aiming at me. Anyways, like I said, Night Out's not tripping. So Stomper, you know, he's out there. He's, he's feeling good because, you know, he put in some work and he's getting that recognition from the fellas out there but his leg is, is tore up. So he's kind of miserable trying to adjust to, you know, his leg. He's on crutches, however he was walking around, however they had him out there. Anyways, around three, four days later, after he gets out there on the yard, they roll him up. They come out there, they snatch him up, and they tell him, look, you can't be out here on this yard. The officer that shot you is still working on this yard. We need to move you. So they end up moving him from A yard to B yard. He can't be out there because the cop that shot him, he's still working the tower out there. And like I said, there's an investigation. So they move him to B yard now. Now he gets over there, he's pissed off because, you know, depending on who's running the yard, yards are ran different. They got different policies, different their metals run their yards, you know, according to how they see fit. So on one yard, you might be able to get away with something. You might be able to do something. But on the other yard, you know, 
They don't play that shit. So Stumper gets to B facility. He gets to B yard and you had Tablas from Florencia 13 and Chato from Arizona Maravilla were over there. And basically they were running that yard. So Stomper gets over there and he's trying to, you know, get himself situated on this yard. And like I said, you know, his legs jacked up. He feels like, you know, he's getting jacked around because they moved him from the other yard. His whole thing was he wanted to really, he wanted to get out of that whole prison. He wanted to get transferred to see if he would end up landing over there in Kern Valley with his little brother or one of his other two brothers. I'm not sure what institutions they were in, but he wanted to get out of Pelican Bay. So he's over there on this new yard now. And so he's out there. He's trying to get situated. Like I said, it's a it's going to be a long road to recovery. His leg is messed up. And, you know, again, this yard is being ran a little bit different. He doesn't like it, you know. So prior to him, you know, as soon as his little brother left, as soon as his little brother left, I told you guys earlier that he had accumulated some debts. He accumulated some drug debts, nothing serious. There were some, some small debts, but nonetheless, they were still debts. And from my understanding, so from what my boy told me, whenever you end up going to the oil for something like this, you catch a pegada, you, you know, you, you do a removal and you got some outstanding debts that you left behind, some small debts or whatever, they usually wipe them clean. Usually they squash them. But in this situation, that didn't happen. I don't know if it was Daryl Baca, it was Night Out from Artesia 13 that was pushing the issue, but somebody was pushing the issue. And they they basically, they approach Stomper on this yard, on, on B yard, and they tell him, look, you accumulated some debts over there, you need to pay that money back. So Stomper's tripping now. He's like, what, what are you talking about? What I mean, what about everything that I did? You know what I mean? I, I, I put in some work for, for, the, for the brother over there. And now you guys are sweating me over some, you know, I got shot. Now you guys are sweating me over some small debts. So Stomper's really mad now. He's mad at the world. Legs all messed up. Anyways, he's in the building at one point. And some other Sureños, they tell him, they give him a heads up. They're like, hey, boy, they're like, when you get out to the yard, they're going to get on you. And he's like, get on me. What are you talking about? So in his mind, you know, Stomper feels like, Again, bad politics, cutthroat politics. He feels like he just put in some work. He, he, you know, he stepped up for one of the brothers and he did a removal for them. And, you know, he feels like he should be given the, you know, a little bit of consideration when it comes to these debts. Squash him or at least give him some time, you know, to get the money. He's on one leg. He doesn't have the financial means to get it. There's no way he can get get that money. He doesn't got, you know, moms doesn't have it like that. You know, I don't know what it was, but apparently it wasn't nothing, nothing huge. It wasn't nothing crazy. It was just a little bit of debt, debt that he accumulated from, from getting loaded. So anyways, these other Sureños, they give him a heads up. Like they, they tell him, Hey, Hey, uh, Hey Stomper, them cats are going to get on you when you get out there. So, you know, now he's tripping. He's like, man, I don't understand this. You know, I've always been good. I've always assisted when I've been, you know, asked to assist. I've always raised my hand. You know, I've ran for, for these guys whenever they needed my assistance. I was always there. My name's good. I don't understand. I've been in the system for, at that point, I think he'd been in the system for about 20 something years. Now, right now, it's been about 30 or a little bit over 30. So, you know, they start, they start pressing them out there. And Chato from Arizona Maravilla, that individual right there, I know him personally. He was on death row. I was over there when that situation happened with character, Jimmy Palma from Sangre. So, you know, I know Chato personally. I've associated with him over there. You know, I was there with, with him. on. A, he, I wasn't on the same tier with him, but I would see him out there on the yard. I've conversated with him, and I know how he is. He's, a, he's one of those, you know, stand-up type of individuals that, He's about his business. Just put, just put it like that. Tablas is another one. You know, him and, and his brother that just recently passed away, Babo Castellanos. Both of those individuals, you know, they're also considered to be some righteous stand-up individuals that, you know, they're deeply rooted within that organization. So anyways, they're, they're pressing them. I don't know 
if there's somebody, they have other Sureños approaching Stomper, who it is, but so he's feeling the heat. But he's also in denial. He thinks that Mosca, you know, Michael Torres, he's got his back. And, you know, he feels like, he really feels like he didn't do nothing wrong, which he really didn't. But, you know, one of the first things that I learned in prison is not to ever get yourself caught up in any kind of drug debt. That is one of the fastest ways to get yourself caught up, either drug or gambling debts. So, you know, I don't know who it was. It's a little bit more complicated if it's with another, you know, another group such as that, you know, the the Woods or the Africanos or whoever it is. But somebody was pushing the issue and they were pushing it hard against Stomper for whatever reason. I don't know. Anyways, Stomper's in denial. And even though they give him a heads up, he goes out to the yard. So he gets out to the yard. You know, when he's out there, he's got his head on a swivel. He can kind of see it. He can feel it coming. Again, somebody that's been around as long as him, he's been out there for 20 years running around on these level four yards. He's familiar with the game. He knows what time it is. You get cats looking at you. They, they Again, they're, they're looking at you inconspicuously because they know something's going to happen and they want to see it as soon as it kicks off. So you'll catch cats, you know, playing handball and they'll constantly be looking over and you just you get that look like like you're a leper or something out there on the yard. People are staying away from you. You know, you walk over to a table and you shake, you know, everybody's hands. And at one point, you know, they all start walking away. Nobody wants to be around you because they know what time it is. So anyway, he's out there. He positions himself in a, a an area where his back's against the wall so he can see it coming. So eventually they send a couple individuals at him, the individuals that they're, they're sending to do this removal. He sees them coming, but he's still in denial. He knows these individuals and he doesn't think that, you know, they're going to do them like that, but it's either him or them. So obviously it's going to be him. Anyways, you know, they walk up to him and straight up they play him out of pocket they shake his hand give him an embrace and boom they take off on him so they're hitting him bam 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 this guy's got a, a messed up leg still and now you know he's got some nice fresh puncture wound you know they don't go in on him hard they don't try to kill him but they whack him good they, they put some good sized holes in him so again the yard goes down you know they prone everybody out so after it's over they go over there they cuff everybody that was involved up and they basically escort them to the hole. But they take Stomper, they take him, since he's the victim, they take him to the watch office. They put him in a cage. He gets over there, you know, they, they put some holes in him, but it really didn't even require medical attention, not bad medical attention. They probably put some peroxide on him, wiped him down, and he was good to go. Put a couple pieces of gauze on him, and he was good. So, you know, he's in the watch office and that's when they come at him and they tell him, look, you're in trouble. You know, the best thing that you could probably do for yourself is to just go to s and -Y, you know, lock it up, man. And he's like, no, nah, I'm not locking up nothing. You know, I'm good. There's no reason for me to lock it up. This is just, you know, a checada. That's what he thinks. And, you know, everything should be everything should be good. You know, where's the waiver? I'll sign it. Put me back out on the yard. So. You know, situations like this, I guess they got this this new thing now. Well, no, they had him all the way back as far as 92. I don't know if it's the same exact thing, but, you know, if you were involved in the situation on the yard and they felt like there was some type of a potential threat to you, you could sign a piece of paper releasing them of liability and they'll put you back out there. So that's what he asked. He requested to sign that waiver. He signed off on it. You know, uh basically re releasing them of any liability if anything happens to him because they're required to let him know, hey, there's a threat and we're aware of it. So, you know, again, he's in he's in denial. So he goes back out to the yard. So he's out there for a couple of days and, you know, if they don't they don't move on him. Apparently he's not somebody that posed an immediate threat. But, you know, surprisingly, they don't move on him the first day. He's out there for a couple of days. But, you know, everybody that's out there, the Suranios, you know, they're again, they're looking at him. They're just giving him that 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 head nod. And he ain't feeling no love out there. Everybody's pretty much staying away from him. So he's out there. You know, he's trying to do anything and everything he can do 
to get those debts paid. Now he's like in full damage control. You know, he, he approaches whoever he talks to, Tablas, or, or he gets a chato, or he sends word to him. However, he communicates with them out there. And he's like, look, I'm, I'm going to try to pay this off. But they're beyond that point at this point. He's been hit out there. So, you know, three, four days go by, and they still didn't send nobody at him. Why? I don't know. Wasn't there, but this is what happened. So he's out there for like three days, and all of a sudden they come out there and they roll him up. They come, roll him up, and they tell him, look. They take him to the hole, and they tell him, look. There's a threat, you know, it's it's a little bit more than than, you know, just the liability issues. There's other issues that we're aware of and we cannot leave you out there on the yard in good faith. So we got to ship you out. It was basically the end for Stomper at that point. You know, I don't know what happened after he got shipped out and went to another prison. I don't know at what point his career was officially over. I know eventually it was over. He gets shipped out at some point, but that's pretty much his story. That's what happened with him. Now, whether or not this has any relevance or it was factored in with, with Stomper's situation, whether there was any involvement or, you know, association at all, I don't know. But after Stomper went to Adseg, after they rolled him up off the yard, they killed his his celly, his celly that he left behind on the yard. It was an individual named Green Eyes from Lennox. You know, it's not clear whether it was associated with Stomper's situation. I can't see why they would just kill his celly unless they felt like maybe his celly was plotting or there was some more to it. But, you know, it happened nonetheless. After Stomper left, about a week later, they ended up killing Green Eyes from Lennox. But, you know, here's another situation. You know, here's another situation with cutthroat politics. And it's 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 sad, man. You know, you got these individuals out there that are getting drugs and that's all that they're worried about. They're getting drugs. People are getting caught up in drug debts. It doesn't matter how loyal you are. It doesn't matter how much work you put in. It doesn't matter how many times you raise your hand to go on these pegadas and and, you know, be that guy that that's shining out there. It doesn't matter. When it comes to dope, drug debts, and all that stuff, it trumps all of that. So, you know, people need to remember, especially you youngsters out there that still glorify this lifestyle. It's a hard life to live. It's not for everybody. You know, a lot of these guys that get, you know, clicked up, it's because they, they're doing life sentences anyway. So it doesn't matter. If you're going to go to prison and you're doing life, then, you know, that's something, it's a different situation. But if you go to prison and you you have a date, it's going to be a hard role for you. Trust me, it's going to be a hard role for you. You'd be better off just being a sureño, not getting clicked up and just, you know, being there to assist when you're told to assist. But, you know, racking up drug debts, racking up gambling debts, again, it's one of the fastest ways to get you caught up. You know, the message, again, in this story is, like I said a minute ago, it doesn't matter how much you do for the organization. It doesn't matter how many times you raise your hand, how loyal you are, how much work you put in, the things that you've achieved along the way, how many years you've been involved. None of that matters at the end of the day. If you become somebody that somehow interferes with the drugs that are coming in, the money, somebody's power, somebody's position, you're going to end up learning some hard lessons. So anyways, with that being said, I know this was a quick one. I got a couple other bangers for you guys. I'm working on them. I'm going to try to get them out tomorrow. At least I'll get one out tomorrow and I'll get one out the next day. The one that I'm going to tell you guys tomorrow is crazy. It's got a crazy twist to it. And it's, you know, some of this stuff, when you hear about it, and how dirty the politics are, man. I know it's got to make some of you mad. I read a lot of the comments and some of you were like, man, this is just, it's crazy. It's over the top. You know, how can this be justified? How can, you know, other C's be okay when they see the things that these guys are doing out there to their own people? You know, but it is what it is. It happens. That's just the way it is. Anyways, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Anyways, Again, this was a, a short one. 
I'm going to try to get another one out to you guys tomorrow. I'm not going to neglect the inner demons. I'm going to get out another one for you guys as soon as I can. I appreciate all the support you guys are giving me and Jay Hands on the Black Widow podcast. That's something we're going to try to continue to do. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how much traction it gets. Lastly, I'm going to post a picture of the weight machine in the community. I'll do it sometime tonight. I know I keep telling you guys I'm going to do it, but I keep getting caught up with other things. So there's two raffles that are going on right now. They're active right now. One is for the Jordan shoes that we always do. And the other one is for a weight set for somebody that lives close to the Stockton area that wants, you know, that is taking an interest in working out and trying to get yourself back in shape. It's a good weight set. So I'm going to go ahead and post those pictures. Just give me a little bit of, give me a little bit of time to put them up. And lastly, last but not least, I told you guys that I'm working on something pretty big that should be coming in about another two weeks, three weeks at the very latest. It'll be sometime in August. This is going to be a big month for me. So you guys stay tapped in. You guys are going to see what I'm talking about. And, you know, I want to roll this out in a way that, um, in a certain way so that you guys will see what I'm talking about. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this story. Again, shout out to Sandman for doing all the editing that he's been doing. We'll try to get on a live sometime this week. With that being said, this is your boy B and I'm out.